Okay, so we've got these articles, right? All about pastors and church leaders, some big names even, and these allegations against them, serious stuff. And honestly, it's kind of hard to ignore this kind of news, you know? It's everywhere you look these days. Yeah, it's definitely been making the rounds. So we're talking about, like I said, some pretty big names. Dr. Stephen Lawson, for one. I mean, he was everywhere. His sermons, his books, you name it. And then poof, gone. Like somebody just scrubbed him from the internet. Yeah, it was pretty sudden. And then there's the whole thing with Gateway Church, multiple leaders leaving, all these allegations flying around. It's a lot to keep track of. It's definitely a complicated situation. And then on top of that, you've got this whole movement from former members of Morningstar Ministries. They're calling for a full investigation into the leadership there. It's like every time you turn around, there's another story. It does seem like there's been a wave of these types of stories recently. So where do we even start with all of this? I mean, are these just isolated incidents or is there something bigger going on here? What does all of this say about the state of church leadership today? Well, the first thing that strikes me is that even though each of these situations is unique, there is this common thread running through all of them. You see allegations of moral failure and those allegations lead to these leaders being removed from ministry. Right, it's like that's the common denominator here. Exactly, and it really makes you wonder what's going on behind the scenes. So let's break it down, starting with Dr. Lawson. It's like someone just hit the delete button on his entire online presence. One day he's everywhere, the next he's gone. What can you tell us about that? Well, it wasn't exactly an accident. Institutions like the Master Seminary and Grace Community Church, they were very intentional about removing his content. And I think that speaks volumes even before we get into the specifics of the allegations. So it's not just about the allegations themselves, but it's about how these institutions are responding to them. Precisely. It's this very clear statement. They needed to distance themselves from Lawson, mm -hmm. and they did so very publicly, even if they didn't give a full explanation for why. Which I imagine leaves a lot of people wondering what to think. Of course. When you have someone as prominent as Lawson just disappear like that, it's bound to create some anxiety, some speculation. So what do we know? Was there any official explanation from Lawson himself or from his church? Trinity Bible Church in Dallas, where Lawson was the lead pastor, they did issue a statement. They said that he was involved in an inappropriate relationship with a woman and that he was being removed from all ministry activities. Okay, so that's pretty significant. Oh, absolutely. And on top of that, Lawson also resigned from his own ministry, One Passion Ministries. They pulled down all his content as well. Wow. It's hard to imagine the kind of impact this must have had on his life, his family. I mean, talk about a fall from grace. What do you think the long term implications are for his ministry, for his legacy even? Even if we just stick to his online presence, it's gone. It's hard to say for sure. But I do think it's a stark reminder that being a leader, especially in the church, it's about more than just, you know, theological knowledge or being a gifted speaker. It's about character, integrity. It's about living a life that's consistent with the message you're preaching. Right, it's about being accountable for your actions. Exactly, and I think that's something that Austin Duncan was really trying to emphasize at the recent Men of the Word conference. You know, amidst all of this, he really highlighted the importance of integrity and in leadership. It was very timely. And you know, it's interesting because his statement really drives home a crucial point. The foundation of leadership, particularly within the church, has to be unwavering integrity. Without it, trust erodes especially given everything we've been discussing, right? It really highlights that connection between integrity and trust. Speaking of trust, let's talk about the Gateway Church situation. <laughs> because this isn't just about one leader, right? We're talking about multiple departures, multiple allegations. Right, it's a much more complex situation. It really is. So for those who aren't familiar with the details, can you give us a quick rundown of what's been happening there? Sure, so earlier this year, their founder, Robert Morris, stepped down. This was after some allegations came out against him. And then more recently, Kemtal Glasgow, another leader at Gateway, was let go. So two high profile departures in a relatively short period. Yeah. And to make things even more complicated, Gateway Church has stated publicly that Glasgow's departure was not related to the allegations against Morris. So two separate issues, but still you have to wonder if there's something more going on behind the scenes. It's certainly possible. And even if these are totally unrelated situations, 
it still has an impact. Two major scandals in a row, it's bound to raise some eyebrows. Absolutely. It makes you question the leadership, the culture of the church. Right. How does a church maintain its reputation, the trust of its congregation, when something like this happens, let alone twice? It's a tough question because people, they look to their church leaders for guidance for moral authority and when that trust is broken it can be really damaging it can be devastating yeah and i think the lack of transparency from gateway church it just adds fuel to the fire it's like that old saying where there's smoke there's fire right wow. exactly and when churches respond to these situations with silence or vague statements it just creates more suspicion and that brings us to the situation at morningstar ministries which is interesting because they're facing a very different kind of pressure yeah, this is different. It's not just rumors or speculation. This is a very public call for action, right, with this whole petition. Right. And it's not just a couple of people, hmm. you know. We're talking over 100. Over 100 former members and staff at Morningstar Ministries, and they're demanding a full investigation. Wow. So this is serious. What exactly are they alleging happened? They're alleging there was sexual abuse happening at the ministry. And not just that, but that the leadership knew about it. They're saying that Rick Joyner, the founder, he was involved in covering it up. So they're going after the top. That's a bold move. What are they hoping to accomplish with this petition? What do they want to see happen? Well, they have a few demands. First off, they want a full independent investigation, no strings attached. They want everything to come out into the open. That makes sense. Right. And then they're calling for Rick Joyner to resign. They say he's not fit to lead anymore, given these allegations. And I imagine they're also looking for some kind of systemic change, something to prevent this from happening again. Exactly. They want to see major changes in the way Morningstar Ministries handles child protection. Yeah. They want policies in place, training, the whole nine yards. So three very different situations, but all with this common theme of allegations of moral failure within the church. It makes you wonder how widespread this really is. I mean, are these just isolated incidents? Or are we seeing a symptom of a much larger problem within the church? That's the million dollar question. And honestly, I don't think there's an easy answer. Right. It's not like we have all the data and can just say, oh, this is exactly how often this happens. It's not like you can just like Google it. Exactly. But what we can do is look at the information we have and try to I don't know, maybe identify some trends. And one thing that I find interesting is that we seem to be hearing about these kinds of situations more and more often these days. Do you think that's because it's actually happening more or are we just more aware of it now? That's the question, isn't it? And I think it's probably a bit of both. Mm -hmm. Social media plays a huge role, right? Yeah. In the past, these kinds of situations might have been handled quietly, internally. But now with the Internet, Information travels so fast. It's true. One tweet and suddenly the whole world knows about it. Exactly. So there's definitely an increased awareness. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's a growing willingness to speak out. We've seen this with movements like hashtag me too, right? Victims are finding their voice. They're refusing to be silent anymore. Right. There's less of a stigma around coming forward. Exactly. And I think that's a good thing because for far too long, the church has been really good at sweeping these kinds of things under the rug. Yeah. But you can't heal what you're unwilling to confront. Yeah. That's a good point. So how do we confront this? Where do we even begin to address this issue of moral failure in the church? Well, I think it starts with acknowledging that there's a problem. We can't fix what we're not willing to admit is broken. So step one, admit there's a problem. What's next? Well, then I think we need to start having some really difficult conversations and we need to be willing to listen really listen to those who have been hurt because often they're the ones who can best show us where the cracks are where the system is failing that makes sense so often we try to impose solutions from the top down but really we need to be listening to those who are most impacted by these issues exactly it's about empowering those with lived experience to lead the way and that means creating safe spaces for them to share their stories to speak their truth without fear of judgment or retribution Creating that kind of environment, it requires a lot of trust. And right now, that trust has been broken in many churches. So how do we rebuild that trust? How do we move forward in a way that's both healing and hopeful? It's tough because on the one hand, we're talking about these like big systemic issues, right? But on the other hand, there are real people who are hurting because of these situations. So where do we even start with that? Like if someone is listening to this right now and they're struggling to reconcile their faith with everything we've been talking about, what do you say to them? Oh man, that's a heavy one. Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is it's okay to not be okay. 
Like it's okay to feel angry, to feel confused, even betrayed. Those are all natural human reactions to what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Don't try to stuff those feelings down or pretend they're not there. It's so easy to feel like you have to have it all together, especially in the church. Right. Like you're supposed to have this unshakable faith. And if you're struggling, well, there's something wrong with you. But that's just not true. So what do we do with those feelings? How do we even begin to process all of this? Well, for me, it always starts with talking to someone. Find someone you trust, someone who's a good listener, and just let it all out. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable, to share what you're really going through. It's about finding those safe spaces, those people who will just listen without judgment. Yes, exactly. And if your faith is shaken, that's okay too. You don't have to have all the answers right now. Just be honest with yourself about where you're at. Sometimes it feels like doubt is this like dirty word in the church, but like you said, it's okay to question. It really is. Sometimes asking those tough questions, it can actually lead you to a deeper, more authentic faith. So how do we do that? How do we move from this place of hurt and disillusionment to a place of healing, of hope? What does that look like? It's a process, that's for sure. And I don't think there's one right way to do it. But I think for me, a big part of it has been about extending grace. Grace for myself, grace for those who have hurt me, and even grace for the church. That's a powerful word, grace. It is. Because when we can start to let go of the anger and the bitterness, that's when the healing can really begin. That makes sense. But it's hard. It is. It's hard work, but it's worth it. So where do we go from here? As the church, how do we move forward in a way that acknowledges the pain of the past, but also creates a healthier future for everyone? That's the million dollar question, right? Yeah. I mean, I wish I had all the answers, but honestly, I think a big part of it is just being willing to have those uncomfortable conversations. We have to be willing to face the hard truths about ourselves, about our institutions. It's about more than just saying we're sorry and moving on, right? Exactly. We have to be willing to listen to those who have been hurt, to learn from their experiences, and then to actually make changes based on what we hear. So what does that look like practically? What are some concrete things that churches can do to create a safer, healthier environment? Well, I think education is a huge part of it. We need to be educating ourselves in our communities about what abuse looks like, how to prevent it, and how to respond to it. It's about creating a culture of awareness, of prevention. Yes, absolutely. And it's about transparency. We have to be willing to be open and honest about these issues, even when it's uncomfortable. Because sweeping things under the rug, it only makes the problem worse in the long run. Exactly. Transparency builds trust, and trust is essential for healing. This has been such an important conversation, though a tough one. As we wrap things up here, is there anything else you want to leave our listeners with? What's the one thing you hope they take away from this deep dive? You know, if there's one thing I want to emphasize, it's this. Don't give up on the church. Yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. We've made mistakes, some really big ones. But I truly believe that the church is still a force for good in the world. We can do this, but we have to do it together. That's a powerful message, and I think it's the perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for joining us for this deep dive. It's been a pleasure talking with you. It's been great. Thanks for having me. And to everyone listening, thank you for joining us for this really important conversation. We know it's not easy to face these issues head on, but we believe that by doing so, we can start to create a healthier, more hopeful future for everyone. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other.
Strength. <laughs> <laughs>